Hello everyone, uh, this is Jason Tondro, I'm your professor for World Lit, and uh, we are starting in on our next reading, which is The Aeneid. The Aeneid is by Virgil. I'm trying to uh, uh, change the scenery a little bit once in a while, so instead of just getting yet another picture of my office with my empty bookshelves behind me, now you get a picture of my home with my empty bare walls behind me. Uh, <laughs> because I, I just moved here and everything's still in boxes. Uh, but... Let's, let's get to the text. I want to try and construct this in a way that's helpful and useful to you. So we'll do it kind of like we did last one. I'll talk a little bit about the introduction to the book and kind of give you guys an orientation. And then we'll walk through it sort of one book section at a time with the presumption that you are listening to me before or as you are reading the book rather than after. I'm sort of constructing these now as, uh, as setups for you. So that uh, you can, I can kind of give you some ideas of what to look for, and some signposts, and some some maybe helpful moments in the in the book as we read. The Aeneid is not as frequently read in high school as the Iliad or the Odyssey. Chances are more of you have never read it before, uh, but it is an extraordinarily influential work, uh, as influential, if not even more so, than Homer. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is that the Iliad is in many ways riffing on Homer. There's a lot of sections of our book which will seem very familiar to you, either from the Iliad or from Odyssey sections that you, maybe you read in high school. Um, in a sense, the Aeneid is kind of a combination of Odyssey and Iliad sort of knitted together. Uh, its protagonist is the character of Aeneas, A-E-N-E-A-S. He's a champion of Troy. He's not one of Priam's sons like Hector and Paris and all those guys were. Uh, but he is a uh, high-ranking, prominent member of the Trojan aristocracy uh, and a warrior. And uh, when Troy is invaded and captured by the Greeks, he flees the city with his father and, uh, and his son and a lot of his soldiers and... Uh, what, he, what is frequently referred to in our poem as the household gods. These were uh, statues uh, or, or representations, physical representations, of ancestors in the Trojan family that, the, that uh, Aeneas's family would have revered as, as their ancestors. They, they, didn't, they didn't consider these folks necessarily to be gods in the same sense that we today think of gods but they would have honored and respected their ancestors, and they had statues of these people, which were very important to Roman worship at the time. And Aeneas escapes Troy with these objects, and with his father and his son, and his fellow soldiers, and they flee Troy looking for a new home. And they sail through the Mediterranean, <coughs> much in the same way that Odysseus sails for years, trying to find his way home. But whereas Odysseus arrives home to find, um, to find all of his old friends and his wife, who's now trying to fend off a horde of suitors and so on, uh, Aeneas arrives home basically to find the Iliad. He, find, he arrives home to find a war. He, he has to, um, this is not a place he's ever been before. He's been promised this homeland in Italy. And he lands there, but of course there are already people living there. And, um, and, and he arrives in the middle of this sort of struggle between different leaders in Italy, and he ends up taking sides with some of them, or they take sides with him. They ask him to sort of join them, and uh, he gets caught up in this civil war, and he meets a woman that he would like to marry. He's already got... He had his, his, he's a widower now, because his wife is dead. Uh, and... Uh, and he has to get involved in this war. And so suddenly, then he ends up getting a rival. He ends up getting a rival in the form of a man who was already going to marry that woman that uh, Aeneas is now, is now eyeing. And this guy, uh, Turnus is his name, Turnus, becomes sort of like the, the Achilles to Aeneas's, Aeneas as Hector. And we go through that whole sort of Iliad thing, complete with super shield and everything all kind of played out in a different way uh, in, in Virgil's poem. So we kind of have this combination of Homer, and, and Virgil's not doing this accidentally. He's intentionally kind of trying to out-Homer Homer. He's trying to take Homer's material and say, yeah, that was good if you were a Greek, 
but we're Roman. Let's talk about Rome. Let's take Homer's ideas and change them and better them and show Roman values rather than Greek ones. And this is one of the things that I really want you to keep an eye out for as you read. Think about the kind of virtues that <clears throat> that um, the Iliad prized. What, what was important if you were a character in the Iliad? Well, issues of personal honor, for example, and, uh, and individuality. You know, th this was a... The, the Greeks were about individual achievement. Um, and they prayed to the gods, but the gods often didn't answer. So it was good to be pious, but uh, that shouldn't be relied upon. Contrast this with, with Aeneas and the story of the Aeneid, in which it's not about individual achievement, and it, it's always about the group, and, and Aeneas is a champion. He's a leader, not because he's an individual, but because he knows how to make the team win. Uh, it's, about, it's about, rather than his individual accomplishments, it's about his duty. You know, he's, a, he's an admirable Roman, because he always remembers his obligations, and he's always true to those obligations. This is very different <clears throat> uh, than, than the Greek story. And secondly, this idea of the way that Aeneas honors the gods. You know, we see Hector honor the gods all the time, and they never help him. Aeneas honors the gods, and the gods respond. It, it's, there is a different kind of piety involved here, and a different kind of relationship between the gods and the men. Um, what else should we be looking at? We've talked in previous classes about this issue of characters traveling from one spot to another. We saw a lot of this in the Hebrew Bible. Characters who were exiled, who were wandering, and they encounter new places, new people, and how do they respond, and how do those people respond to the traveler? Look for that in uh, the Aeneid. Look for the ways that, uh, that um, Aeneas encounters new people. How does he treat them? How do they treat him? And which of those reactions are we supposed to identify as the right way or wrong way to, to treat strangers and travelers? Uh, think of Aeneas as this sort of refugee, this pilgrim who's you know, going from one place to another. Another thing to keep your eye out, and this is something that's kind of unique to the Aeneid that we haven't seen much in our previous reading, is this question of empire and colonialization. This is one of the reasons why we still read the Iliad, or the Aeneid today. The Aeneid is a poem, in many senses, about building Rome, which at the time that it was written, about 50 or so BC, uh, was, was building into an empire. Uh, Unlike, unlike the construction of the Iliad, which took place in 800 BC in a time period that we know almost nothing about because there was no historical written records, we know a lot about Virgil and about his patron, Augustus. Um, when I say the word patron, I mean the guy, the wealthy, powerful guy, in this case the emperor of Rome, that Virgil wrote his poem for. He was asked to write this poem. And the Romans were meticulous in their record keeping, so we know all kinds of things about Virgil. You know, we know that he was a real person. We know what he had written before. We know what he wrote after. We know the way some of the ways that his book was received. Um, we know that Augustus seemed to like it, although it maybe wasn't as self-flattering as he had hoped it would be. When he asked Virgil, "Why don't you write an epic poem about Rome?" he probably meant, "Oh, and make it about me, right?" But Augustus does appear in the book, but in a very only in a couple of spots, and although those spots are always intensely flattering, it's always presented very positively, uh, he's, not, he's not a major character. He's, he's a side note, because, of course, the events of the Aeneid are happening, uh, well, if they're set right after the Trojan War, which is about 1200 BC, they're happening over a thousand years before uh, Augustus lived, right? So Augustus can't be a character, except in those moments where we get prophecy about the future. But all of this leads up to this idea that, um, that it's a book about Rome, and Rome was becoming an empire. It was conquering its neighbors. It was especially places like Carthage and, and, and uh, uh, places in Egypt and, and farther out through across, uh, throughout Europe and even 
what we would think of as the Middle East, uh, across the Mediterranean. Uh, how should we think about that idea, that the, that the empire is growing, that Rome is now conquering and taking over these other lands and these other peoples? Should we, how do we treat those people? Do we integrate them into our society? Do we make it possible for them to become Romans? Do we call them Romans? I mean, you might live in Egypt or you might live in um, Lebanon or something, but, but because you're part of the Roman Empire, does that make you a Roman or do you have to live in Rome to be a Roman? This is not an inconsequential question in our own country, right? Where even today we're talking about what does it mean to be an American? Do you have to be born in America to be an American? Maybe that's not enough. Maybe it's not enough for you know your parents to have flown here when you when your mother was pregnant so that you could be born here and be an American. Maybe maybe that's not enough. Or maybe we should make some kind of maybe you have to earn to be an American. Or maybe it is. Maybe you know we have now this idea of of well. Maybe you weren't born here in America. Maybe you, you were born in another country, but now you're here and you're going to college here and you're serving in our army and you've done, you know, you've, you've done service for our country. So maybe we should recognize that and maybe that's what makes you an American. So these are the, these are the same kind of questions that we're, we're going to be talking about in this book. Uh, when Aeneas lands in a foreign country and he helps to create an empire there, he, he takes over a city and that city starts to expand and it finds its neighbors and it has to relate relate to those neighbors. Are you going to relate peacefully or are you going to conquer them and how are you going to integrate these people into your own land? The, the, this creates questions of what we call colonialism and empire. You know, the, the idea of reaching out beyond your nation's borders to take somebody else's land and how do you incorporate that in? Um, and, and the United States has a long history of colonialism, uh, not only as a colony where we were founded and originally a, a colony of another kingdom, but then we, in our turn, over the last 200 years, have often gone out and taken over places and added them to our country. Um, not only physically in the continental United States, but other places too, in South America and, and, and so on, where we have gone and basically tried to, you know, we didn't, we didn't necessarily conquer uh, Cuba, for example, or conquer Puerto Rico or other parts of Central America, but we have often attempted to influence those places and make them do what we want them to do. Uh, the, this question of colonialism and the ethics of empire uh, are going to be brought up a lot in, in the Aeneid. Because these were questions that, that Romans themselves were asking themselves. And finally, I think one of the ideas that we should keep our eye out is this question of what kind of values and virtues does Aeneas have as a role model for Romans? Think of this book much like the Iliad or the Hebrew Bible or the Christian New Testament as a book that's designed to teach um, moral conduct. It's designed to give you a, an example of good conduct which we, the readers, should then mimic or honor. It doesn't do this through long speeches about how people should act, necessarily. It does it through example through a character making choices and doing things and reacting to problems in his life. And then because we admire that character, we think, oh, okay, I'll act like him. What would Aeneas do, right? And what we often find is that Aeneas is confronted with these challenges, these problems in his life, and his reaction is usually, well, we have to persevere. We have to muscle through it. We have to just endure. And there's this notion of what we would now call stoicism, although... The Stoicism as a philosophy wasn't really quite developed by the time that Virgil was writing. Um, but this notion that um, life is very difficult, it, it's very hard and challenging, and we have to endure. We have to just, we have to ag accept that difficulty, and uh, we, we, by enduring it, we show ourselves to be better people. There is a kind of nobility in enduring hardship. Um, we're going to see Aeneas do this a lot. <clears throat> Ask yourself, when we're talking about the difference between Greek and Roman beliefs, how does Aeneas react to that kind of cunning and trickery and cleverness that we've talked about in the Iliad and in the Hebrew Bible, right? In, in the Iliad, 
Odysseus is a hero because he comes up with a way to solve the Trojan War, right? And and he, for example, Odysseus is the one chosen to go talk to Achilles, and and Odysseus is constantly looked to as you know the guy who's good with words and he's he's um, clever and cunning, and we should admire that. In the uh, the Aeneid, Odysseus is a bad guy. All of that trickery and and cunning that we would admire is portrayed rather as deceitfulness and lying. He's just not trustworthy. He's a con man, as a scam artist. And and this shows the difference, a difference, in Roman value versus Greek value. Roman values are prized truthfulness and straightforwardness and honesty more than the Greeks who valued this cunning and trickery and your ability to be smart is better better than being than being strong. That is not true in this book. So keep your eye out for those changes. And I think what you're going to find is this all becomes very useful ways of, of getting into our text, finding a way to, to think about it and talk about it in comparison with other books, which, of course, lends itself to test questions. And that's going to get us to the midterm, your first midterm, which you will be taking after you've read this book and watched this lecture. Now, you have a lot of questions about the midterm, and I'm, I'm uh, sympathetic to that. After we do this lecture right now, I will put up the midterm questions and you will have a week to write them and respond to them before we get into the next uh, uh, reading section where we're going to start our medieval literature, we're going to start Beowulf. Okay, so let's pause right there. We're going to pause for a few minutes. We'll come back and we'll start right away with book one, okay, of the, uh, of the Indian. All right, uh, we're back, and we're going to start off with the first couple books of the uh, Aeneid. When, if you look at our book and you flip through it at all, what you've seen is, is that we have the first three books in their entirety, and then we skip book four, we've got you know, uh, another book, book uh, five, and then we skip a whole bunch more, and then we go right to the end. This is pretty common. Uh, the Aeneid is 12 books long. It's a it's it's amazing poetry. It's it's very uh, it's very good literature. But we don't have time to read the whole thing, and even the excerpts are a hundred pages. What parts do we keep? Well, we keep two sections, essentially. The first is all the stuff about Dido. Dido is the great female character of the Aeneid. She is uh, Aeneas's first love interest. She is the queen of her own city, Carthage. Now, you'll want to probably do some quick historical research here. You can just Wikipedia Carthage and you'll get the whole short version. But, um, but in brief, if you imagine the Mediterranean Sea and Italy is up here, right? And, and Rome is on the bottom of, of Italy. Across the Mediterranean Sea, on the northern coast of Africa, is the city of Carthage, right? Uh, and it's referred to in our poem as being in Libya, but that was just a Roman term for everything in North Africa that wasn't Egypt. Um, Carthage is, an Af is a city in northern Africa, but its people are not considered by Rome Africans. They are considered to be um, you know, what we would think of as Middle Eastern. Uh, Dido herself is a refugee from the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, and you see her and her fellow Refugees from that land often referred to as Tyrians or Tyrians, T Y R I A N S. Um, she's physically referred to as having golden hair. So, uh, although she is the queen of a city in North Africa, uh, race I think does get into this poem a little bit in the sense that she is not portrayed as being black. She's portrayed as white. Uh, and, and again, if we were trying to imagine what Dido was like as a person, we would think of her today as being Middle Eastern. Tyr is a city in Lebanon, <clears throat> uh, famous because it was eventually conquered by Alexander the Great. Tyr, where Dido is from, is a city that's basically on an island uh, off of the coast, and, and you, can't, you can't get to the city most of, except by boat. Alexander the Great conquered it, after building an enormous causeway, which is like a bridge except made of dirt. It's like this, he 
he basically made an, a man-made um, a pathway leading from the shore uh, most of the way out to, T- to the city of Tyr. Uh, but he wasn't able to finish it because the, the ocean dropped off real steeply ste- right very close to Tyr, so he wasn't able to actually finish the last bit of the, of the leg. Well, anyway, Dido is a refugee from the city of Tyr where she was married, uh, but she got into a um, dynastic squabble there. The, her brother was the ruler of the city, and he got a hate on for Dido's husband um, and, and killed him. And she ended up fleeing the city of Tyr along with all the rest of a bunch of her followers and, and hangers on. And so she arrived in Carthage, which at that time was just a, a small little town, and she was welcomed there and was made the queen. So, think about it, right? This becomes a connection that Dido and, and Aeneas both have. They're both refugees. They're both settling new lands, and they're, they're, um, they have this kind of spiritual connection. Well, you know, we've both, we've both been kicked out of our previous home, and, uh, and they're both, they're both uh, once married already. Aeneas has uh, had a wife in Troy, and Dido had, had her husband. Dido is an immensely important and interesting character who has been the object of poetry, prose, and, and song for literally 2,000 years. So keep your eye on her and, and come to some sort of idea as, as a reader what you think of Dido and the, the situation that she is in and that she puts Aeneas in. Uh, the, the beginning of the Aeneid begins with a, a call to... The gods, right? Um, if we look at the beginning of the of the poem, wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate. I sing. In other words, Virgil is pretending he's putting on the appearance that his book is actually oral poetry. It was designed to be spoken, to be recited. Of wars and a man I sing. It wasn't. It was written down. But it's pretending to be oral. I think back to all the things that we noticed when we were reading the Iliad that were signs of oral poetry, like patterns, for example, that a poet would use. So when Agamemnon tells about all the trophies and awards he's going to lavish Achilles with as, as a presence, if only Achilles will come back to the fight, then when Odysseus goes to repeat that, those, those uh, gifts, He uses the exact same word-for-word language because the poet had this pattern that he had memorized and he just used it all over again. These are signs of oral poetry that are absent in the Aeneid. It's much more of a written text. And what does that mean for us, the reader? Well, for one thing, it's got more going on. It just has more plot. In, In the Iliad, we had a lot of sort of cyclical, repetitive stuff. You know, one guy... When a Greek attacks a Trojan, they throw spears at each other, they fight over the body. This sort of cycle repeats over and over and over again. I mean, you guys probably are bored because you thought you had to read a bunch of it. But there's whole books of, uh, of the Iliad that are nothing but re- repetitions of war, fi- war scenes and, and, and fight scenes. Um, the Iliad is a fast-moving plot. Things that Homer would have spent half a page on like preparing a banquet for a feast, because he has this whole pattern structure of how we portray Patroclus carving up the beef, you know, for, for his guests that have come to visit. He, <coughs> he has this whole set piece that he recites. Virgil doesn't have that set piece, and he doesn't feel obligated to show that he knows the set piece. This is, you know, to us, when we look back at, at Homer, we think that it's a sign that, that oral poets, you know, weren't very good, that they had to repeat this stuff over and over again. But but to the audience, they, they thought this was a sign that the poet was good, that he knows all these patterns and he can call them up at the drop of a hat and knit them together and put them together in all these interesting ways. Virgil doesn't, doesn't want to show all that. He, he doesn't want to use those patterns. And so what you'll find is, is that he's got more varied language, more varied structure, which makes it, generally speaking, faster and easier to read for us because we, we don't feel bored. We don't feel like we're hitting repetitive moments. But this means the plot goes pretty rapidly, and it means we need to be closer readers. All right? So uh, make sure that you give yourself the time to read this book. 
you've got about 100 pages, and the poetry is, is not as fast as, as Homer. So budget the hours, right? Read the first couple of books, see how long it takes you, and then you can budget the rest of your time. Um, what else should we look at? Um, there are moments in this book, uh, in the first book, in which we get signs of this question of patronage. We've talked about how Virgil had been asked to write this poem, this book, by Augustus Caesar. Okay, so let's very briefly trace some of the history of this Augustus guy and who is he. Okay, so you've all heard of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. Well, not really. He, he was going to be made king of Rome when uh, some other members of his court betrayed him because they were afraid that, that as a king he would make himself a dictator, which was probably true. And so rather than let him become king, they stabbed him in the public forum and killed him and it claimed that this was done to preserve the Republic. Rome had previously been ruled as a, as a shared power. We'll, we'll, we'll create a Senate and we'll, we'll give some of the power there, but we'll also put people in charge, but we'll split the power up. So maybe we have, we don't have one leader of the city, maybe we have two or three, and we'll split the power up between them. And they'll be fighting sort of each other at the same time as they're fighting the Senate. And all of this will help to keep people honest and keep any one person from taking over. This sound, if this sounds familiar to you, that's because the American system of government was inspired by, and in many senses built on, this question of Rome. Think for a minute about the people who founded uh, the American system of government. Are, uh, weren't they refugees too? Weren't they also having just set sail from a place which within, li within living memory of some of these people uh, you know, had been uh, uh, repressive and, and had, uh, had persecuted them? And so they, they, they fled, like Dido. Uh, or, or like Aeneas, who felt like he had to, to fight a war with the Greeks, you know, uh, before, before he could set sail. Well, anyway, so you have a country founded by refugees. So, of course, they look to a poem written about refugees founding a city when they start thinking about founding their own and, and their own system of government. Anyway, um, so Julius Caesar, his uh, family name was, was Julius, and You'll, as you read this first book, you'll come across lines where we find out that Aeneas's son is called Julius, uh, or Iulius, Iulus, I-U-L-U-S, however you want to choose to pronounce that, but it's probably Iolus. Um, this becomes a, a this is a, a call out to Virgil's audience, because Julius Caesar had a great nephew, which he had adopted into his family, and that guy's name was Octavian. After Julius Caesar died, there was a civil war in Rome that broke out between people that thought that Caesar should have been killed and people that thought he shouldn't. And the person that thought he should have been killed was Mark Antony, and Mark Antony fled to Egypt, where he shacked up with the Queen of Egypt. Okay, so this sounds familiar to people, right? You've got this uh, a North African country ruled by a woman who was not African but white. Cleopatra's name, Cleopatra, is Greek, and it comes from her dynasty, which, which took over in Egypt after Alexander the Great conquered it. They were called the Ptolemaic, P.T., Ptolemaic dynasty, and, and Cleopatra is part of that. And... Uh, Mark Antony fled to Egypt, had an affair with Cleopatra. They had children. Uh, the other side of the Civil War was run by Octavian. He was the leader of that side, and Octavian was Caesar's great, great nephew, adopted into the family. And the two had a, eventually had a massive battle by, at sea, uh, and Mark Antony lost, and Octavian won, and Cleopatra committed suicide. These facts are not irrelevant to the poem you're about to read. Because Dido's, Dido becomes a Cleopatra sort of stand-in and mirror. And 
just as Mark Antony's relationship with Cleopatra was portrayed as a bad thing for a Roman to be doing, as a stain on Mark Antony's character, so Aeneas' relationship with Dido is portrayed as a stain on his character that he must, if he wants to be a good man, he must reject right? and, and, and avoid. And, like Cleopatra, Dido will end up taking her own life. So she's a, she's a kind of uh, commentary on Cleopatra after those events would already have happened. Now, so Octavian ends up winning the war, uniting the empire, and he takes a new name, Augustus Caesar. And he becomes the first emperor of Rome. And it's that guy who asked Virgil to write this poem. So these events, these events with Cleopatra and Mark Antony and the death of Julius Caesar and all that stuff, that was living memory for the people that are reading and writing the poem you have in your hands. And so all this stuff about Dido and North Africa and refugees and civil war, this was not irrelevant. This was, this was like yesterday to the people that were reading this poem. Okay? All right, so, uh, so anyway, so I'm looking at... Uh, page uh, 972, around lines um, 330 down to about 350, where Aeneas traces the family line of the Julius family, which is Julius Caesar, back to Iolus, the son of Aeneas. Uh, it's like it's like saying, well, you know, you're you're a Washington. You know, your your family line goes all the way back to George Washington, the founder of the country, kind of thing. Um, speaking of which, there's a clever passage down in here. Um, I'm looking at um, about line three fifty one. Uh, the terrible gates. Of, this is a prophecy. This section of the book is a prophecy about the future, and uh, Aeneas is being told about how all of these. Um, great family members are going to arise and, and they're all um, the future leaders of Rome. The terrible gates of war with their welded iron bars will stand bolted shut and locked inside. The frenzy of civil strife will crouch down on his savage weapons, hands pinioned behind his back with a hundred brazen shackles monstrously roaring out from his bloody jaws. Okay, so that's a lot of imagery, but what's it about? Okay, well, the civil strife issue, and the, then you have the gates of war issue. What, what Virgil is writing about here is that Augustus became famous as a guy who, after all the civil war was over, had a time of peace. And Rome had not known a time of peace for hundreds of years. This line about the gates of war, there were actually physically gates of war in Rome which were opened when the city was at war and, and closed when the city was at peace. It's sort of that idea of I'm going to open a can of whoop-ass on you, right? Well, I'm going to open the gates of war and I'm going to open them and you're going to get it, right? And don't make me open no gates of war on you, right? Well, the trouble was is that Rome never closed them. They opened the gates of war and, and the, the war went on and there were just always more wars until finally... Uh, Augustus, after the civil wars were all over, closed the gates and had a time of, of long-lasting peace. And that peace, which it, it was happening during the time that Virgil was writing, is what here appears as a prophecy of the future, because, of course, Aeneas lives a thousand years before all those events. Okay? Uh, ask yourself, if we had gates of war here in America, when was the last time they were closed? been a while right? since the gates of war were closed. All right, so uh, are there any other uh, elements that we should look at? Um, on uh, page 975, um, okay, so Aeneas, <clears throat> like many of the characters from the Iliad, has a divine relative. Remember back last week when we were talking about the whole origin of the Trojan War, with the golden apple and the three goddesses, and Paris had to pick one. One of those goddesses was Aphrodite. One of them was uh, uh, Athena. And the other one was um, Jove, 
uh, excuse me, Juno, the wife of, the, of Zeus. Well, Paris picked Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love, because her bribe was better than the other two goddesses. Well, when he did that, that meant that Aphrodite was going to side with the Trojans in the war, but that the other two women, who got slighted, who felt like they had been insulted because they weren't picked, they would side with the Greeks, right? Okay. That conflict is still going on in this book. So Aphrodite, who in, to the Romans was known as Venus, Venus is Aeneas's mother. And she sides with the Trojans. Meanwhile, Athena, who is known as Minerva in this book, uh, and uh, Juno uh, are siding with siding against Aeneas. Pretty much whoever's against Aeneas, they're in favor of, right? They're, they're no longer fighting with the Greeks in, outside of Troy because that war's over and the Greeks have all gone home. But, um, but sometimes the Greek characters sort of pop back up in this book because it's kind of a sequel. So you'll see characters like Diomedes, whom we mentioned very briefly um, last, last week. Diomedes shows back up. Other characters say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Greek refugee. And, and Aeneas will, will reach out to them and create a bonds of loyalty and ties them. And they'll say, well, look, that fighting, that's, that's all over now. Troy's, Troy's fallen. Let's put that war behind us and team up. And, and you know, we're starting to get these ideas of Roman virtue going on here, right? Let's build a consensus. Let's, let's put our, our old differences aside and, and, and build a political union. Uh, so that, that structure is still taking place. And at this point, in this point of the poem, um, uh, Venus shows up to give her son a, a little helpful advice and to help him out. And she will continue to do this throughout the poem. But she appears to him in disguise as a, like an Amazon huntress with a bow and her skirt's all hiked up so that you know, she, she can run. Uh, and, and she pretends to be this anonymous Amazon that shows up and guides Aeneas in to the city of Carthage. But as she's disappearing, Aeneas recognizes her as his mother. But, and he's, he, he's frustrated by this because she never just shows up and talks to him. You know, like like a mother would do, right? She always has to pretend to be somebody else. He knew her at once, his mother, and called after her now as he sped away. Why, you too, cruel as the rest, so often you ridicule your son with your disguises. Why can't we clasp hands, embrace each other, speak out, and tell the truth? See, this is exactly what we're talking about. This question of truthfulness, of honesty, that's to be prized. And trickery is to be, to be disregarded. I mean, it's effective. It works, but it's not honorable. It's not, it's not the way that the best heroes conduct themselves. Right? You're going to see throughout this poem, throughout this book, that Aeneas is, can be a very human character. He has moments where he struggles, where he, he wonders what to do. Um, he, he was a very sympathetic hero. And we've talked about this a little bit last week. The Greeks identified with the Greek heroes of the, of the, the Iliad, right? With characters like Achilles and Agamemnon and Menelaus and, and Odysseus. But ever since the Greeks, the rest of us have identified with the Trojans. The, the people of Rome, in particular, considered the Trojans Troy to be the good guys of the Trojan War and, and the people who were more deserving of praise. And they consistently, throughout this poem, you're going to see Achilles referred to as a brute who's as mean and wicked to the Greeks as he is to the Trojans. That he just can't be relied upon. He can't be trusted. He's just too reckless and too violent. And that rage that Homer speaks of, that Homer acknowledges as a problem, was too much of a problem for the Romans to overcome. You know, they just couldn't see the human side of Achilles. He was just, he's just, a, I, mean, I mean, the guy that, that savages Hector's body, for example, the way that, uh, that Achilles does. There's just no, no uh, excuse for that kind of behavior. You're a lesser man when you do stuff like that. So uh, Aeneas, as a Trojan, is, is the champion. He's the, he's the hero, and... And in centuries that come later on, 
This idea that, that the Trojans were the heroes and that every great society is inspired by Troy and by lineage from Rome would take root in a lot of societies. There was a, there, for a while, for example, this is during the time of Chaucer, whom we haven't gotten to yet, but in, in Chaucer's era, um, there was actually a, a move to change the name of, um, of London uh, to New Troy. Nova Trovantium, and there was this root, this legend that Britain was called Britain because it was named after Bruton, who was a member of Troy, who's a Trojan refugee, right? Who sailed all the way and and founded a new home in in Britain. In other words, they wanted to out Rome, Rome, right? So, in that context, American government and political culture founded on Rome, is just one more example of this idolization of the Rome and of Troy in an attempt to grab onto that and kind of ride its coattails into history, right? If Troy is great and Rome is great, then if we can be like Troy and Rome, we'll also be great, right? Okay. Um, a few other sections from this first book that are maybe worth, worth looking at. Um, So Aeneas lands on the, on the shore of Carthage. <clears throat> First, um, his, his fleet is attacked by storms. Um, Juno, the queen of the gods, has a hate on for him because he's a Trojan, and, uh, and also because she knows his, his legend. From the very beginning of the book, it's established that Aeneas is going to land in Italy. He's going to form, found this great city, and his ancestors are going to rule that city. Juno is jealous of that, and she seeks to destroy Aeneas and ruin his future. So she convinces the god of the winds to create a terrible storm and wreck the boats. And the storm continues until Poseidon, the god of Neptune, the god of the sea, comes up and says, hey, this is my territory, get out. And, and he calms the storm, and, and but the fleet has been scattered. And... Aeneas thinks that the boats are all sank. So he, he um, lands on the shore. This is when um, his mother appears to him as a, an Amazon and leads him into Carthage, where he sees Dido. And it turns out he also sees a bunch of his other sailors who were on these other boats that were all scattered. And they've also come, but they've come to Dido basically begging her to let them, let them into the city and give them food and shelter and let them r fix their boats and, and get back to sea. Uh, at this point, uh, um, Aeneas's mother, Venus, is concealing Aeneas and all of his crew with like a magic spell of invisibility. So they can't be seen or heard. They're just listening to everybody else. But then finally, right when everyone is thinking, oh, and poor Aeneas, he's probably dead, the spell falls away and Aeneas and all of his men are revealed to them. And Aeneas is, <laughs> Aeneas is the son of the goddess of beauty, right? So, of course, he's incredibly handsome. He's, like, supernaturally beautiful because his mother is a, not just a goddess, but the goddess of beauty. And Dido sees him and, and says, you know, he's so dreamy. And, and the, the, their fate is, starts to become entwined at that very minute. Uh, well... Dido is reluctant at first to express her affection for Aeneas because she was married. Her, her husband is dead, but she feels that to be faithful to her husband, she should not love another man. And so Aeneas's mother has to get involved. And so Venus goes to her, her other son, not her mortal son, Aeneas, but her immortal son. And of course, this is Cupid, the, god, the, the, the guy with the arrows. We think of Cupid now as like a little baby with wings, but the, the Romans didn't think of him like that. He was just this really handsome guy. With, but he still had the bow, and he still had the arrows. And she goes to Cupid and says, okay, look, I want you to masquerade, I mean, put on the disguise, and I want you to pretend that you are Aeneas' child, his son. Uh, and you're going to go to Dido 
and you're going to use your powers and make her fall in love with Aeneas. And there's this scene where, where Cupid, in the shape of Aeneas' son, comes up to Dido and sort of buries her head, his head in her chest, you know, and she sort of pats him, and, and she said, he's such a beautiful kid, and, and, and she finds him so irresistibly charming. And if you, if you think back to last week when we were talking about how this, the presentation of the gods might not have been literal, it might be just a poetic device designed to, to show social or psychological forces that are hard to explain otherwise. You can kind of see what's happening here. You know, Dido is, Dido is, she's, she's falling in love with Aeneas because he's so handsome and he's got this great reputation and he's a great leader and, and so on. But then, then she starts to really bond with Aeneas's kid. And she thinks, you know, maybe, maybe this is okay. Maybe, maybe this is right. Maybe this is the way that my life should go. So, um, she she makes Aeneas an offer, you know, why don't you just stay? Uh, I'm on, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead here because it's in book two, but uh, she, she welcomes Aeneas and says, look, you and all your men, you can just stay here as long as you want and I'll feed you and set you up and, uh, and then we'll just kind of see how it goes. So this is the, uh, the initial uh, uh, book, and it's our first setup. Um, the quote I was looking for is here. It's on page uh, 980, about line 685. I will provide safe passage. This is Dido speaking to all of the Trojans. I will provide safe passage, escorts, and support to speed you on your way when you decide to leave here. I'll, I'll, I'll help you with that, everyone that I can. Or would you rather settle here in my realm on equal terms with me? The city I build, it's yours. Haul ships to shore. Trojans, Tyrians, they will be all the same to me. If only the storm that drove you, drove your king, and Aeneas were here now. She's talking to the refugees before Aeneas, is, the spell is broken. This is Dido's offer before she's even met Aeneas. She says, look, you're refugees. I'm, refu I'm a refugee. Let's all just make this our home together. And before she even knows that Aeneas is here, she shows her generous heart. I think this is, it seems like this is really important for Dido because it shows that she's, she's not a selfish person. She's not self-motivated. She has nothing to gain from welcoming the Trojans in. She just has compassion for them and for their situation. Okay, let's pause here, and then we'll get to books two and three uh, of the Dido story, okay? Okay, book two of the Aeneid is the flashback scene. Like the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid starts off in media res. This term we used in a previous class, it means in the middle of things. It starts off with Aeneas in the storm, right? Picking an exciting moment for the story to start. <clears throat> but at some point, we had to tell how Aeneas got here. And a lot of the things that we think about the Trojan War are actually found here in the Iliad, I mean, in the Aeneid, rather than in the Iliad itself. If, when you get to Book 2 and you read Book 2, you're going to see a lot of familiar signs and stuff from the, from the Trojan War, including the horse and the whole story of how the Trojan horse gets built and how it gets smuggled into the city and, and, and all of that story. Uh, you're going to meet a lot of characters. There's a couple of them that I want to dwell on. One of them is this character of Sinon. Uh, all right, so you're the Greeks, and Odysseus comes up with this plan. Look, we're going to build this giant horse, and we'll, we'll take apart a bunch of our ships to make it, because we don't have any wood. And we'll, we'll put the very best Greek soldiers that are still alive, because Achilles is dead, and a bunch of other people are dead. Put the best soldiers that are still alive in the horse, <clears throat> and then we've got to get the horse into the city. How do we convince the Trojans to bring the horse into the city? Well, the first thing that they do is they move their boats, and there's like an island that's barely within sight of Troy. So they all hide their boats on the far side of the island. But then they get a guy, and his name is Sinon. And he gets captured. They leave him on the shore, 
And when the Trojans come out, because they see that all the boats are gone, they, they're suspicious, and they go out and they find this guy, this Sinon guy. And Sinon tells them the greatest lie ever told. Right? He says, oh, man, I came out to hunt you guys down. I came out to kill Trojans. Um, but, uh, but I was captured back again. I was recaptured by the Greeks. <clears throat> and, uh, and they were going to sacrifice me. Now, this is a reference to the story of how the Greeks left Greece in the first place. After the army, the Greek army had been assembled, the, the gods were unhappy, especially Artemis, and uh, the goddess of the hunt, the virgin goddess of the hunt. And she, she had a grudge against Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek army. And so she stopped the winds. Well, of course, the, Greek, the Greeks all had to sail to get to Troy. So without the wind, they literally could not set sail. In the army, there's a thousand ships sitting there doing nothing, month after month after month. Until finally, Agamemnon then goes to the oracle and says, okay, what do I got to do? I've obviously pissed off the gods. What do I got to do? And the oracle says, you have to sacrifice your, your virgin daughter. And Agamemnon doesn't want to do it. This becomes a, chest, a test for him. Are you going to sacrifice your daughter for this war? This, she's an innocent. She's never done anything wrong. Well, Agamemnon makes the wrong choice. He sacrifices his daughter, which he shouldn't do, because she's an innocent. But he doesn't. Because this is to demonstrate his conviction and his commitment to the war. Not to the gods, but to the war, right? Because if we can get to Troy, we're going to be the richest men alive. Well, anyway, so he sacrifices the daughter, although at the last minute, he doesn't know it. At the last minute, Artemis whisks the daughter away and saves her, which reminds us of something else, right? <clears throat> From the Hebrew Bible stuff whisks the daughter away, and she lives forever peacefully in another place. But she has a whole other story. But Agamemnon thinks that he killed her. And more importantly, Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, thinks he killed his daughter, and she hates him, and she plots to kill him when he returns. Well, anyway, so Sinon's story is, oh, the Greeks, they, they're tired of fighting, they wanted to go home, and they went to the god, to the oracles, and asked, what do we got to do to go home? And the oracle said, oh, you have to sacrifice somebody again. And, and to the Trojans, you know, this all kind of makes sense, right? Okay, you had to sacrifice somebody to get here, so you had to sacrifice somebody to get back. And, and Sinon says, and they picked me. They were going to sacrifice me. Boy, I, I got out of there at the last minute. I, I snuck away, and, uh, and they left anyway. And I'm so glad you guys found me, because I was going to be sacrificed. And this... This story has got enough, you know, convincing parts in it that the Trojans are convinced. And there's a couple of people in the Trojan camp that think this is wrong, that they, we shouldn't believe this guy, but they're discredited or killed. Uh, one of those naysayers is Cassandra, who can see the future, and she knows that the Greeks are going to conquer the city, but she's also been cursed by the god Apollo, so that whenever she gives a prophecy of the future, no one ever believes her. And we still use this phrase today. We call someone, when we call someone a Cassandra, this is specifically meaning you're a person who's wise enough to see the future, but no one ever believes you, right? Uh, the other guy that can see this coming is a guy named Laocoon. He's another priest, and he knows what's coming. But when he tells the Greeks what's going on, tells the Trojans what's going on, the Greeks send a sea monster to come eat him and his kids, <laughs> So uh, everyone decides, oh, well, see, Laocoon said bad things about this horse, so he, and he got punished by the gods by getting eaten, so obviously we should take it. So they take the horse in, and they bring it into the city, and then um, that night the, the soldiers, Sinon, the, the, the Greek guy, um, opens up the belly of the horse, and all the Greeks get out. Once again, Sinon is this tricky guy, this trickster guy, who's a villain. He's a bad guy. He's not in any way honorable in this book. He's portrayed very badly. Now, in, if Sinon was in the Iliad, he'd portray, be portrayed very differently, right? Um, much of the bulk of this story, of chapter 2, book 2, is the story of Aeneas' escape from the city. He's been asked to tell this story by Dido. Aeneas is staying in Dido's home, 
he's at dinner and feasting all the time with her. Uh, of course, she's lavishing gifts on him. He's a prince of Troy, um, a great hero, and not only that, she's falling in love with him. So she wants to, you know, make him, uh, she wants to put on the, the best show she can. So she asks him many times, because she loves just hearing him talk, she loves he hearing him tell the story, tell the story of how you escaped from Troy. And what we hear is the whole story of, of Aeneas and how he woke up to find the city on fire and then how he gathered his family and smuggled them out of the city. And we find, we meet, for example, his father. Uh, this scene is, it's in our book. Um, Uh, starts on the uh, 102, excuse me, 1002 to 1003, about lines um, 790 or so. Aeneas finds his father, and his father is, is an old man. He's a grandfather. Uh, and his father tells Aeneas, you know, don't, don't worry about me, because Aeneas' father is also a cripple. His he has to walk with a cane. He, he's lame. He can't walk. He was punished with this by the gods um, because he didn't respond the right way after he found out he had slept with Venus, right? Because uh, Aeneas is the child of the goddess of love. Well, she had an affair with Aeneas' father, and he didn't know who she was at the time. And he found out who she was, and he wasn't properly grateful that he'd been tricked by the goddess of love. And so he was cursed with with. Um, physical uh, deformity. Uh, at last, gaining the door of Father's ancient house, my first concern was to find the man, my first wish to spirit him off into the high mountain range. But Father, seeing Ilium raised from the earth, Ilium was a, a, another name for Troy, refused to drag his life out now and suffer exile. You, he argued, you in your prime, untouched by age, your blood still coursing strong, you hearts of oak, you are the ones to hurry your escape. Myself, if the gods on high had wished me to live on, they would have saved my palace for me here. Enough, more than enough, that I have seen one sack of my city once survived its capture. Here I lie, here laid out for death. Come say your parting salutes and leave my body so. I will find my own death, sword in hand. My enemies, keen for spoils, will be so kind. Death without burial, a small price to pay. For years now, I've lingered out my life, despised by the gods, a dead weight to men, ever since the father of gods and king of mortals stormed at me with his bolt and scorched me with his fire. He's talking about his physical uh, injury. He says, ever since the gods crippled my legs, I've been useless. Now I'm going to stay here and I'm going to die with my sword in my hand. This is very much a Roman virtue, this idea of I'm going to die with my sword in my hand. And it, yes, we all know I'm going to die, but I'm going to stand here and go down like a man. This, this is a Roman virtue, and you're going to see characters throughout this book holding up this idea. Well, Aeneas says, hell with that, you're coming with me. And he, he grabs his father... <clears throat> And he tells his father that, look, just hold on to my back. And he carries his father piggyback out of the burning city. In addition, they take the household gods. We talked about these before. These are the statuettes that would represent um, revered members of the ancient family. Um, they're never named. They're never given anything more specific than the household gods. And, uh, and Aeneas feels like he's not uh, clean enough. He's not pure enough to touch them. So he asks his father to carry them. So his father's got the household gods like bundled up under one arm, and he's holding on to Aeneas' you know, neck with the shoulders with his other arm. And Aeneas has got his shield in one hand and his spear in the other. And he's just trying to make it out of the city with his father. Um, and then he's got his son. He like grabs his son by the hand and, and leads him out too. Uh, this is a famous scene that shows up in art and poetry and, and drama for 2,000 years of Aeneas carrying, physically carrying his father out of the burning city.
Um, while, while you're reading this, look at things like Aeneas' uh, speech to his own men, which can help to establish Aeneas' reputation as an excellent public speaker and uh, a leader. Men, brave hearts, though bravery cannot save us, if you are bent on following me and risking all to face the worst, look around you. See how our chances stand. The gods who shored up our empire have left us. All have deserted their altars and their shrines. You race to defend a city already lost in flames. But let us die. Go plunging into the thick of battle. One hope saves the defeated. They know they can't be saved. This is, this is Aeneas speaking to his fellow soldiers before he's found his father as, as uh, Troy is burning around them. He's like, look, we have nothing left to lose. Let's go out like men, right? Uh, what else should we look at? Around, uh, on page 1001, you will encounter Helen. Uh, and there's a moment where Aeneas finds Helen and has a moment where he wonders, what should I do about her? Because he's furious over the destruction of his city, and of course he blames it all on Helen. So maybe I should do something about this. But he restrains himself and leaves her. Because if he, you know, if he gives into his rage, that's not going to be an honorable choice. That's not something that's worth worthy of a, of a champion and a leader and a hero. Uh, all right, so that, that's just a very quick skim through book two. Then uh, we skip book three entirely. Uh, we have a very brief summary in your book of book three, uh, which is telling the story of Aeneas traveling across the Mediterranean and all of his various adventures where he does things kind of like Odysseus does. In the Odyssey, he visits his dead father. His father passes. He rescues his father, but then his father dies on the boat. Uh, they travel for a while, and then he travels to the underworld. Aeneas travels to the underworld where he sees his father, and his father gives some prophecies about the future. And then we pretty much pick up it, uh, in the present where Aeneas is now back in Dido's, Dido's palace. Okay, so let's pause there for a minute, and we'll come back and talk about book four. Okay, welcome back. We're doing, talking about book four of uh, the Aeneid, which in my opinion is the heart of the book. <clears throat> this is the, the chapter that deals with uh, Aeneas and Dido's consummation of their love and then Aeneas' decision to leave her and then Dido's uh, self-destruction. Uh, it's, it's the most famous part of the Iliad and it's the part that, uh, that poets and, and singers and artists uh, and and writers have talked about for 2,000 years. It starts off with, um, with Dido admitting to his, her sister, Anna, that she's in love with Aeneas, but she, she doesn't feel like she should uh, continue this relationship. She feels guilt over loving him because she has a dead husband. And Anna becomes the voice of encouragement and reason here. It's the very bottom of 1008. But Anna answered, Dear one, dearer than light to me, your sister, would you waste away, grieving your youth away, alone, never to know the joy of children, all the gifts of love? Do you really believe that's what the dust desires, the ghosts in their ashen tombs? Have it your way. You know, this, she's, she's arguing with Dido, look, you know, do you really think this is what your husband would want? Do you really think this is what the gods and, and our ancestors want is for you to be unhappy for the rest of your life. Live your life. You know, if you love a guy, love him. Well, so encouraged by Anna, um, uh, Dido decides that she, she will yield to uh, her love, and they, she's out partying with, they, they decide to go on a hunt. And the gods start getting involved here, uh, and they, uh, they arrange a, uh, a thunderstorm to take place, which drives Dido and Aeneas into nearby caves. Well, 
you got a handsome guy and his beautiful girlfriend and they they had their first moment of privacy in probably two weeks, right? Because they're never alone. They're, there's always servants and hangers-on and friends and relatives and everybody around. They had their first moment alone since they've gotten here. And uh, they, they're not... They're, they're, the rainstorm keeps anybody from finding them and they, they're not going to be expected back as long as the storm is on. So, you know, nature takes its course, right? Well, it's more than just that. Um, the gods specifically Juno, the goddess, uh, the, the queen of, of the gods, creates a kind of marriage ceremony for them. In Roman tradition, you would use torches that the, the, the two lovers, would, the two that are going to get married, would have a torch, and they would sort of swear by their torches. Uh, so, if we look, I'm on page 1012, Primordial earth, that is the, the god or the, the force of the earth itself. And Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal and lightning torches flare and the high sky bears witness to the wedding. Nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death, the first of grief, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cares no more for appearances, nor for her reputation either. She no longer thinks to keep the affair a secret. No, she calls it a marriage, using the word to cloak her sense of guilt. Okay, Juno and the Earth cooperate to stage a kind of cosmic wedding. There's no priest. There's no official rites. They didn't. Aeneas doesn't think he married her. He at least he says later, "I didn't marry you. I didn't say the rites. I didn't hold. I didn't hold a torch." The torch and the, the marriage hymns are provided by the earth and the sky and the nymphs, you know, the sort of cosmic forces are going on. That creates the wedding. And for Dido, that's, that's enough. To her, she's married. And she doesn't even try to hide the relationship anymore. She tells everybody, oh yeah, Aeneas and I are married. You know, this is, in, in the ancient world, you didn't need a priest to be married. Two people got out in public and they said their vows and they were married. And, and to Dido, their marriage is blessed by the gods. I mean, that's who held the torches at their wedding, was the earth, you know. So she's convinced that they're married. And, and we see this idea, this concern with rumor. Rumor will be personified as a kind of evil, wicked goddess in this, in this book. It's, it's not in the Iliad. That, sh that should make us wonder. Right? That maybe this is a concern, an anxiety of Romans in particular for your reputation, your good name. The concern of keeping your good name unstained seems to be much higher for the Romans than it was for the Greeks. Uh, so Virgil says that, that now Dido's just like, she's not even pretending to keep her good name anymore. She's claiming she's married. Well, but she wasn't according to Virgil. She wasn't really married. She, she had this kind of cosmic wedding, but that's not the same thing. And you can see Virgil judging this marriage on the next page. The end of that first long stanza there. I'm on, a, I'm on uh, 1013, about line 245. Um, Here this Aeneas, born of Trojan blood, has arrived in Carthage, and lovely Dido deigns to join the man in wedlock. Even now they warm the winter, long as it lasts, with obscene desire, oblivious to their kingdoms, abject thralls of lust. And this, it turns out, is actually the problem. That ignorance of their kingdom. When Dido and Aeneas get married, or whatever you want to call it, they stop paying attention to their duties. And all of the new towers and construction that was going on in Carthage, because Dido had to build the whole city, right? That all stops, and she just hangs out in the house and parties with Aeneas all the time. You know, they just hang out with each other. And Aeneas also forgets his duty, because he also has a duty, a duty to Rome, to the city that he has yet to found. And 
And he's forgotten all that. In fact, there's this point later on where he's specifically shown uh, wearing like a toga or cloak that Dido has had made for him, a purple with uh, golden, golden marks on it and so on. Uh, Ten fifteen. This is this line is uh, said from the point of view of Hermes, or Mercury, the messenger god who's come down to find Aeneas. Soon as his winged feet touch down on the first huts in sight, he spots Aeneas founding the city fortifications, building homes in Carthage, and his sword hilt is studded with tawny jasper stars. A cloak of glowing Tyrian purple drapes his shoulders. A gift that the wealthy queen had made herself, weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. Mercury lashes out at once. You! So now you lay foundation stones for the soaring walls of Carthage? It's like, hey, what about Rome? Now you're, now you're wearing your girlfriend's clothes. Now, you're, now your sword is studded with jewels. Now you're building a house here. You got, you've got a duty. It's not... It's not Aeneas's joy to leave Dido and to go off and found Rome. It's his duty. And a good Roman does his duty to Rome. Aeneas is perfectly happy. Dido is even happier. But he is shirking his responsibilities. And that must end. And so the, the, the gods get involved. And Zeus says, okay, you go tell Aeneas that uh, he's had enough of a, of a break. He needs to get back on the boats and, and make his way to, to Italy because we got things to do. Well, Aeneas's affection for Dido breaks instantly uh, upon being reminded of his duty. Because he's a good Roman, he puts all of his uh, fine clothes away and he begins wondering, how am I going to break it to her? that I've got to go. He, he can't figure out how to do this. He, he's, he knows he needs to tell her, and he plans on telling her, but he can't figure out how to tell her. Like, boyfriends around the world can sympathize. Girlfriends too, for that matter, right? I know I want to break up with him, but I don't know how to break up with him, so we'll just let it go for a little while until I can figure out how. So he's thinking about how, how he's going to do it, and he tells all of his men to get the boats ready, because, you know, once I tell her, she's going to blow her top, so we got to be ready to go. So they all get the boats ready, and she finds out that the boats are being, being prepared. So, of course, she says, weren't you going to tell me? You were going to sneak out, weren't you? You were just going to slip out and never say anything to me. And he's like, no, no, I was going to tell you. It's like every lover's quarrel ever, right? I, it, for 2,000 years, nothing has changed. Anyway, the breakup speech, you know, is, is always exactly the same. Well, so, so she accuses him of trying to hide that he was going to leave. Once again, truthfulness, right, versus deceit. He insists that he was going to tell her. He's a truthful, honorable Roman. Uh, but he just hadn't figured out how yet. And, and finally he says, look, okay, well, I'm just going to go. And, and he, he goes to his boats. They haven't set sail yet because they don't have a wind. So they go back to the boats and she can see the boats from her palace. Right. And so she keeps like sending messengers and stuff saying, just please don't go. Just, just stay a little bit. At one point she says, oh, you know, if only you'd given me a kid, then I'd have like a little Aeneas, you know, that I could, I would at least keep me company in, in my old age. And then she says, uh, you know, then she sends her sister, Anna. Just, he always liked you, Anna. Just go, you go, you go tell him and say, well, maybe you could just stay for a little while. I mean, I understand that we're broken up, but maybe you can just kind of hang out here for a little while longer, so I have some time to say goodbye. None of that works. And and Dido begins to lose all hope, and she uh, she's tortured by her love for Aeneas and his rejection of her. And it's the rejection, in particular, that burns her, and she feels guilt. Because she feels like she betrayed her original husband for nothing now, right? I mean, it was different when she had when she had Aeneas with her, but now she feels like she's lost Aeneas, and she spurned her, the memory of her dead first husband. So she decides that she's um, in like a in 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 true Cleopatra fashion, right? She's going to take her own life, but. She knows that if she tells people that what she's going to do, they'll stop her. So she has a trick. She has to trick them 
which I don't think we're supposed to think is a good thing. I think we're supposed to understand this is bad. If she was going to just kill herself, she should just do it. But she convinces her sister, Anna, that uh, she's going to use a magic spell. She's going to get a witch, uh, like a, an enchantress, and this enchantress is going to cast a spell that will cure her of um, her longing for Aeneas. They're going to get all of the possessions that Aeneas had, because, you know, he had clothes and all kinds of belongings, and there's the bed that they slept in together, and all the stuff, all the physical things that remind Dido of Aeneas. And, you know, every girlfriend uh, and knows what I'm talking about, the sort of box of stuff that, you, that remind you of all the things you did together. Well, anyway, and she says, look, we'll just burn them. We'll burn them. It'll be part of the spell. And we'll burn all these things. And when the spell is cast, I'll be free of him. Or he'll return to me. One of the two things will happen. Well, Anne is pretty skeptical of this whole business, but she's like, okay, well, well whatever. If it'll help you, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. So they start getting all the things together. Meanwhile, Dido's planning on killing herself. So she finally, um, she finally does, but not until after she insists many times to Aeneas that they were married. And we can really see Dido's perspective on this. You know? she, this is one of the reasons why the character has been so captivating to history, is because she's sympathetic. She, she feels like, you know, we had the only marriage that kind of marriage that counted. And we said we were together, and we were together. But Aeneas insists. It's on page 1017. I never dreamed I'd keep my flight a secret. Of course I was going to tell you I was going to leave. Don't imagine that. Nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. He says, I never married you. It's pretty cold. I slept with you. But I never married you. So I don't feel like I have to stay. Aeneas is kind of an ass. He's, but I think if there's any redemptive feature here, it's that he doesn't want to go. But rather he feels like he must go. He's doing what he must do. And this compulsion to do, to, to, to leave. He's not happy about it, and he tries to explain it to Dido in every way that he can. But she can't get over his betrayal, and especially her guilt over her dead husband. So they gather all the things together, and Aeneas finally departs, and... Dido, um, she lays down on the bed with his sword, which she's kept. And, uh, and she's lying down on the bed with the sword, and then someone comes in, and they realize that she's rolled over on it. And it's impaled her. And it's, it's a terrible, tragic scene. For a moment before that, before the death, she wonders, "Well, what am I going to do now?" You know, I mean, we look back on her and we think, "Well, you know, you just she, he left you. The story is going to suicide. Suicide's a, a drastic reaction." But she's in a bit of a she's traumatized, and also she does give some thought to what she's going to do next. But she feels like she's out of options. This is the bottom of ten twenty two. And now, what shall I do? Make a mockery of myself? Go back to my old suitors? Tempt them to try again? Should I go back to Tyr? And all the people that were chasing after me there? Or all the guys that were chasing after me here in Carthage? Dido was a beautiful queen and she was single. You, we, they're never named for us, but you can bet that there were a hundred guys in Carthage that wanted to marry her. And she told them all no. Well, what's she going to tell them now? Because clearly... She's not placing the memory of her dead husband first and foremost. She doesn't have that as an excuse anymore because she shacked up with Aeneas. Now she feels like now, you know, every guy in the city is going to think I'm a whore. Beg the Numidians, grovel, 
plead for a husband? Though time and again I scorned to wed their likes? What then? What else? Okay, so if I can't go back to the suitors, trail the Trojan ships, bend to the Trojans every last demand, should I just chase after them wherever they go? So pleased are they with all the help, the relief I lent them once, that they, they haven't listened to me now, they're not going to listen to me when I chase them. Well, anyway, she decides that uh, death is her only way out. And as she dies, uh, she curses them. She curses Tro the Trojans and says that there will never be peace between my people, the people of Carthage, and your people, the people of Rome. And this is Virgil explaining the long antagonism and, in fact, the wars that happened between Rome and Carthage previous to Julius Caesar's day. The greatest series of wars that Rome fought in its early time period during the Republic were the so-called Punic Wars, which were fought against Carthage. And uh, this is the famous scene, maybe you've heard of it, of, of the Emperor Han the, the General Hannibal of Rome. Uh, me, I'm getting all mixed up now. General Hannibal of Carthage, who attacked Rome um, by, with elephants, which they couldn't take on the boats because the elephants were too heavy. So they went all the way around, uh, around the Mediterranean and went over the Alps with elephants and attacked, uh, tried to get, once he got these elephants over the mountains, then he, he attacked Rome with them. These, these wars between Carthage and Rome were epic and legendary, and they were seared into the memory of everybody that was an audience for this poem. And now Virgil explains why Rome and Carthage have been, had been enemies. Well, eventually Rome won, and they didn't just defeat Carthage, they completely annihilated the city, and they ruined the fields so the fields wouldn't grow anything, and they did just, they went Roman on them. Uh, Compare this death curse, for example, to the power of death in the special magic words that you see in things like, like uh, the Old Testament. Okay, let's pause there, and then we'll move on with the rest of the book. Once Dido is dead, Aeneas' past is kind of behind him, and then he sails on to Italy, where he arrives and finds uh, a whole political controversy already happening that he has to get himself injected in. For our purposes, that's basically halfway through the book. Um, the first, the, the Dido stuff is basically the first half, and then at the end is when he has to deal with Turnus and, and his new, Aeneas' new future wife, Lavinia. Okay, so we'll pause for a minute and then come back. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend as much time on the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the Aeneid because frankly I don't think it's as interesting uh, as the Dido stuff. But I want to give you some heads up so you have at least some milestones to look for as you get to, the, to reading the remainder of the book. Um, you're going to meet some characters who become mirrors of characters in the Iliad. Uh, at this point, think of Aeneas as being like Hector. He becomes the Hector of the second half of the Iliad. Well, if he's Hector, then he meets a guy, an old king, whose name is Evander. This is who Evander Holyfield is named after. Evander is a, a, a king in Italy, uh, old. He's got a young son whose name is Pallas. Now, the young, he's not so young that he can't fight. He's a young warrior. He's just, just old enough to be able to fight. And uh, Evander sort of puts Pallas into Aeneas' um, studentship. And we, this is a, becomes a physical representation of, in many senses, what this whole book is about, which is teaching Romans how to be good Romans. Um, Pallas, uh, this is Evander talking. Uh, I'm on page um, 1042. I will pair you with Pallas, my hope, is my son, my comfort. Under your lead, let him grow hard to a soldier's life and the rough work of war. Let him get used to watching you in action, admire you as his model from his youth. To him I will give two hundred horsemen now, fighting hearts of oak, our best, and Pallas will give you two hundred more in Pallas's name. And Pallas becomes kind of the, the heroic character uh, the, uh, of the second half of the Aeneid, the junior uh, version of Aeneas, if you will. Okay, well, if we've got a hero now, we've got Aeneas and Pallas, well, if Hector, uh, 
who's, who's our enemy going to be? We need an Achilles, right? And this Achilles, uh, 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 Aeneas' rival, is named Turnus. Turnus is formally engaged to uh, Lavinia, who is Evander's daughter. And uh, Lavinia doesn't have much of a presence in these books. She doesn't speak very much. She's certainly no Dido. Um, but she seems willing to do the politically expedient thing and marry Aeneas because Aeneas is a powerful leader with a big army uh, in boats and he's got a big family dynasty and my father likes him. So I think it's also important that Evander is old enough that he's thinking about who's going to run the kingdom when I'm dead, but Pallas isn't quite old enough to really be an effective leader yet. So maybe he's looking for somebody to hold the reins until Pallas is old enough to do it, and Aeneas would fit that bill better than Turnus. Um, well, think about the plot of the Iliad with Achilles refusing to go into battle, Hector uh, as, the, as the enemy, um, and then Patroclus goes into battle and dies, and that forces Achilles into battle. Well, it's kind of a reversal of that. Um, Pallas becomes kind of like the Patroclus to Hector. He becomes, um, if, if you think of uh, Aeneas as, as a kind of Achilles just for a second, P Patroclus is kind of like his, his second, right? So what happens is his Pallas goes into battle and Turnus kills him. And this prompts uh, Aeneas to, to go after Turnus. But the second half of this book is punctuated by two great attempts at peace treaties, the two warring cities, uh, the city where Turnus is leader versus the city that, that Evander is leader. They try to come up with a peace treaty, and both times it falls through. It's the second time that it falls through that we actually see it in our pages. The first time was skipped over. It's in one of the books that we skip over. But what we see is Aeneas and Evander swearing that they're going to uh, have, oh, and Turnus is involved as well, that they're going to have a single duel. Turnus and Aeneas will just fight one-on-one. -on -one. And this will spare all the armies and any innocent casualties, and innocent people from getting caught up in the battle. Turnus and Aeneas will fight, and whoever wins gets to marry um, Lavinia and, uh, and will become the future king, and we'll just we'll call it there. And Turnus agrees to this, even though he thinks that he can't beat Aeneas in a stand-up fight. Now, this is after he's killed Pallas. Well, like Achilles, who had a supernatural mother, who showed up and did all these kinds of things for him, Turnus has a supernatural sister, who's a magical being, like a fairy creature. And she manipulates people in the same way that Thetis Achilles' mother used to manipulate people. And so she, um, she doesn't want her brother to get into this duel because she thinks he'll lose, and he will. So she ruins the peace. She actually gets the rest of the army to, she picks a fight. And um, she scares this one priest who throws a spear, and, and the spear kills one of these brothers who happens to be in Evander City. And the brothers all draw their weapons, and pretty soon everybody's fighting. And so she creates this civil disorder and this strife in order to save her brother from the one-on-one -on -one duel. And just like Achilles refuses to go into the battle and spends a lot of it hanging out of the battle, so Turnus spends a lot of this resulting, the last book of, of the Aeneid, um, spends a lot of his time avoiding a fight with Aeneas and instead driving his chariot around the outside of the battle where he's picking off stragglers. He's using his spears and his sword to kill single soldiers kind of running around the outside of the battle. And he kills lots of people this way, but he, ref but he doesn't fight Aeneas. And so once again, we see Turnus's, Turnus's actions mirror Achilles and not in a good way in a way that I think we, as readers, are supposed, to, um, are supposed to consider a bad example. So there's a lot of parallels 
with the uh, with the Iliad. But while as the Iliad takes twenty four books to do all of this, the Aeneid compresses it, and there's a lot of action that happens very quickly. Um, there's two more things that I want to touch on before we wrap up. The first is this question of the shield, because like Achilles, uh, Aeneas gets a special magic shield. Aeneas's mother is Venus, the goddess of love. And in this tradition, we don't see it in the Iliad, but in this tradition, Venus is actually Hephaestus's husband. Hephaestus is the Greek name for the guy that the Romans called Vulcan. He's the god of the forge. And although he was physically deformed and ugly, he was the goddess of love's husband. And so she goes to him, and she embraces him and hugs him. And there's one at one point where Virgil writes, and they and they they did what men and women do. And then the next morning, right, uh, Vulcan is asked to help Venus out by making armor and shield for her son. And he agrees to do this. I think we can see a lot of very interesting stuff if we compare Aeneas' shield and the symbology that, that's there to the Achilles' shield and the symbology, the metaphor that's working in there. Let's see if we can find the shield. The shield is on um, 1045, page 1045, and it starts... Um, about line 738. Uh, then the burnished greaves of Electrum smelted gold, the spear and the shield, the workmanship of the shield. No words can tell its power. Virgil says, no words can tell you how great the shield is. Now let me tell you how great the shield is, right? So he writes for about a page about the shield, and like Achilles's, it has pictures all on the outside of the shield. It's divided into sections, and each section has a different image on it. Look back, I'm, I'm, I mean, line, line for line, look back at the description of Achilles' shield and compare it to this one. And what are you going to see? Achilles' shield depicts people at war, kings, marriages, funerals, people working in the fields, none of whom are named, all of whom are anonymous. And by making them anonymous, that means that they become everyone. There's no Spartans or Athenians or Thebans or Corinthians, all the people. Who, they're not even Greeks and Trojans. It's just everybody. The signs that are on the outside of that shield of Achilles, those are actions everybody in the war would recognize and identify with, regardless of what side you were on. It becomes a unifying symbol. Compare this to Aeneas' shield. Uh, Aeneas' shield depicts famous characters from Roman history and, because he's a god, famous characters that will be in Rome's future but which to Virgil were in the past, right? Virgil's writing like 50 BC about events that took place 1000 BC so he's writing about things which to Aeneas were the future but which to Virgil were the past. So on the shield are things like Romulus and Remus, the founders of the city of Rome. This confused me a lot when I was a kid. I was like, well, wait a minute. If Aeneas founded Rome, I, th I thought Romulus and Remus founded Rome. Okay, to be fair, to clear clarify this, Aeneas does not found the city of Rome. He wins the city, a city. But they make a big deal about this at the end of Book 12, when Juno comes to Zeus, Jove, the king of the gods, and says, okay, 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 you win. Aeneas is going to win. But these people, the Italians, I love these people. These are my people. I'll, I'll, I'll stop throwing obstacles in Aeneas' way. But don't make the Italians lose who they are, their identity as Italians, as Latins. The word, the word they use is Latins, right, after the language of Latin. Don't make the Latins 
lose their cultural identity and become Trojans. She says, look, Troy is destroyed. Tro Troy is dead. Let, let Troy stay dead and let the Latins be Latins. And, and Zeus agrees. He says, yes, you're right. Tro Troy is no more. Troy is burned. This is not Troy. These are the Latins. And Aeneas will become their king, but he won't call them Trojans and he won't change their name. His son will inherit and become the new ruler. And then later, a couple of generations later, Romulus and Remus will found the city of Rome, which will become the center of this empire that's already started. So anyway, back to the shield. You see Romulus and Remus, and they get, they get raised by a wolf. This is the legend. But then you see other famous people in Roman history, all the way up to Augustus himself. Augustus appears around line 790, 795. And here in the heart of the shield, the bronze ships, the Battle of Actium. That was the battle between Octavius, which was Augustus before he changed his name, Octavian, and Mark Antony that took place near Egypt where, where Cleopatra took her life. You could see it all, the world drawn up for war, Lucata headland seething the breakers, molten gold. He's, de he's depicting, trying to depict the, the naval action because it was a battle at sea. On one flank, Caesar Augustus leading Italy into battle. The Senate and people, too, the gods of hearth and home, and the great gods themselves. High as stern he stands. The twin flames shoot forth from his lustrous brows. His eyes are like fire. And rising from the peak of his head, his father's star. On the other flank, Agrippa stands tall as he steers his ships in line, impelled by favoring winds and gods, and from his forehead glitter the beaks of ships on the naval crown, proud ensign earned in war. Agrippa was Augustus's ally in the battle. All right, so the Roman shield, Aeneas' shield, in some ways it's the same in that it represents all of society and it depicts, and it, you know, there's a point that, that we were past we were just reading where it's like, oh, he's not just Rome. He also represents the people in the Senate, which themselves are, the Senate itself is a representation of the people. It's a symbol, meaning all of Rome, right? All of the Roman citizens, all of the people helped to be, create the, the Senate. So it has a sense of that aspect of Achilles' shield in the sense that it represents all of society. But it's all Roman society. Achilles' shield was a unifying theme that broke down this borders of nationality and that united Romans, no, not Romans, united Greeks and Trojans together into one people, one common shared human experience. This is not Aeneas' shield. Aeneas' shield is us against everybody else. Rome. It's a celebration of Rome. Not of shared humanity, but of Rome. It's a propaganda piece, in a way, that, that we should understand is not new, right? And it's not, it's not unique to this poem, or this book. Um, America has plenty of propaganda pieces. This is one. You know, it's... it's it's like the Pledge of Allegiance. It's celebrating national identity. Imagine, imagine, um, <laughs> you know, last, last episode in this lecture, we were talking about this example of the shield, and we talked about how if a guy goes into battle with a red and white circles and a white star with a blue, with, with a blue background on it, he's, he's not just carrying a shield anymore. He becomes a walking metaphor for his, his country that the shield represents. That's much closer to what's going on here in Achilles with uh, Aeneas' shield. He may as well have a Roman flag on it. It's, it's I'm, I'm Captain Rome, right, when I put on this shield. Not just the Rome that I, that, that I know, because Aeneas doesn't know Rome yet. He's, he's only been in Italy for uh, you know, a couple of weeks. But for the Rome that's coming, the Rome that I will build, all of that Rome, that empire of Rome, I represent. And I think this interest, this is an interesting comparison and contrast, and it shows you, maybe, what, what the Aeneid is saying and where it's coming from as a piece, what its purpose is as a piece of literature compared to the Iliad's object as a 
as an instrument of literature, right? I would, sit, I would postulate, and we'd have to work a lot more about this if we wanted to prove it one way or the other, but using the shield solely as an example, I think we could argue that the Iliad is more about sympathy for all humanity. It's more about seeing what you admire and respect in your enemies as well as yourselves. It's about breaking down barriers. As much as, as, much as it's about war, it's about seeing yourself in your enemy and realizing, hey, maybe he's more like me than I think. But this book is about the triumph of one cultural identity over another cultural identity. And Turnus isn't nearly as admirable of a character as either Achilles or Hector, at least in our reading of the poem. Now, to the people that were in Rome, Achilles was a jerk. And Turnus has all of Achilles' faults and none of his virtues. All those moments where Achilles would think back and have those moments of calm reflection where he realized, you know, how, how lousy the world is and how it just keeps getting worse and... You can work and work and work and work and, and never earn the reward you deserve. All of those moments where he repents, where he is gracious to Priam, for example, Turnus doesn't have any of those moments. He just has all the bad things of Achilles. Right? Well, all of this makes the Aeneid come out to sound like a lesser work of literature when you compare it to the themes of the Iliad. But I want to get to the end of this book and see if maybe this casts it in a bit of a different light. At the very end of the Aeneid, um, Turnus has finally figured out that his sister is leading him off, uh, keeping him from battle, and he rejects her and agrees to fight Aeneas one-on-one. -on -one. He's got his sword, and Aeneas has his spear. Now, we talked about this last class. This is a loser's fight, right? Because everybody knows a spear is longer. And before Turnus can get to him, Aeneas stabs him. I mean, it's that simple. It's really a factor. It's not a matter of skill or whatever. It's a matter of who hits first. And Aeneas hits first, and Turnus is dead. Or actually, let's be more accurate, Turnus is injured. He's grievously, he gets stabbed in the leg. And Aeneas is one. He's one. And he comes up to Turnus, and Turnus asks for mercy. Well, isn't that interesting? Because it's, the, it's, it's a reverse Hector, right? Think back to the moment when Hector was lying there, dying. And he was telling Achilles... Take a good look, man, because right? you're next. You're going to be me. And when you're me and you're dying, the gods are going to remember what you did to me here right now. And he asks Achilles, you know, just when my father comes to ransom my body, just give him what he, can, what he asks for, and he's going to offer you money to take it. And Achilles says, no way. Right? No way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on your face my boot, and I feed you to the dogs and the vultures. And Hector's like, oh, so this is the great Achilles. Right? This is the guy that everyone else praises, says it's so great. The guy that's going to brags about stepping on my face when I'm dead. Okay, so what do you think Aeneas does? What do you think Aeneas does? If Aeneas is Hector, if he's the Hector metaphor, right, and, and Turnus is the Achilles of this book, then you would think that Aeneas would be cool. He would do the right thing. He would say, you're right. You're... This is... Let's look at the last scene. I know I'm kind of spoiling the end, right? But come on. All right. So this is the bottom. I'm on the bottom of 1071. Turnus pleaded, seize your moment now, or 
If some care for a parent's grief can touch you still, I pray you. He's pleading with Aeneas based on love for a father. Which, you know, Aeneas carried his father on his back out of the city. This is a huge deal for Aeneas. You had such a father in old Anchises. Pity Donus, that's Turnus' father. Pity Donus in his old age and send me back to my people. Or, if you would prefer, send them my dead body, stripped of life. Here, the victor and vanquished, I stretch my hands to you. I stretch my hands to you. So the men of Latium have seen me in defeat. In other words, I, I, I'm lying on the ground, and I reach up physically from the ground so that everybody around can see that I'm defeated. Right? I've like raised my hands. I'm, I'm beaten. I surrender. I give. Lavinia is your bride. You won. She's yours. Go no further down the road of hatred. What an astonishing thing for Turnus to say. Right? Okay, you win. She's yours. Go no further down the road of hatred. This is Hector's moment. Remember that moment in the Iliad when Hector was thinking, oh, here comes Achilles. I could just give him everything. I could just give him Helen. I could give him all the money of Troy. That's stupid. Achilles would just kill me. Aeneas, ferocious in armor, stood there still, shifting his gaze and held his sword arm back, holding himself back too, as Turnus' words began to sway him more and more. Aeneas is persuaded by Turnus' pleas of first, father's guilt, right? Look, my father's old. He's going to miss me when I'm dead. Have pity on the old guy and just send me back, okay? Or, how about this? You win. Everyone sees I'm surrendered. Everyone sees I've lost. You get Lavinia. You win. And then, finally, go no further down the road of hatred. Right? He sort of pulls a moral argument. Look, there's no reason to hate me. Right? And Aeneas is buying it. He's, he says, you're right. When all at once he caught sight of the faithful sword belt of Pallas, Turnus wears a trophy that he got off of Pallas' dead body, like, like the way that Hector was wearing the armor of Achilles that he looted off Patroclus, right? And Hector sees the belt that he's wearing Swept over Turnus' shoulder, gleaming with stite studs Aeneas knew by heart. Young Pallas, whom Turnus had overpowered, taken down with a wound, and now his shoulder flaunted his enemy's battle emblem like a trophy. And he sees this sign from the young Pallas that was under Aeneas' personal care, and his rage just boils over, and it overwhelms his morality. Aeneas, soon as his eyes drank in that plunder, keepsake of his own savage grief. It's his grief over the death. Just like Achilles I was outraged by the death of Patroclus. Flaring up in fury, terrible in his rage. Does that sound like Achilles? He cries, decked in the spoils you stripped from one I loved. Escape my clutches? Never. Pallas strikes this blow. Pallas sacrifices you now, makes you pay the price with your own guilty blood. And in the same breath, blazing with wrath, he plants his iron sword hilt deep in his enemy's heart. Turnus's limbs went limp in the chill of death. His life breath fled with a groan of outrage down to the shades below. That's the last lines of the poem. Aeneas Aeneas loses. I know it doesn't seem like that because he, he's done everything up to this point and he, he, lead, he wins the battle and he gets Lavinia and he gets to be king. And, but he betrays his moral code and yields to grief and rage at the end and he kills Turnus who is helpless. It's a, it is 
I think, along... It is Aeneas' most human moment in the entire book, and it comes in the last eight lines. And, and we see this moment in... I mean, it's a revenge moment, right? How many, how many movies have we seen with this? Like, Mel Gibson's entire career is based on this moment, right? Now it's Liam Neeson doing all these revenge movies. But it's the same idea. It's like, okay, well, I should let you go, but, you know, you're an asshole, so you're going to die. And, and or you did something wrong to me. You know, you killed someone close to me. You, you killed my wife. You killed my child. You kidnapped my daughter. You, you whatever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kill you. And that's and that's Aeneas' excuse. He says, it's not me killing you. It's Pallas killing you. It's it's revenge. It's eye for an eye, right? Now, we should ask ourselves, what would be the audience's reaction to this moment? Would they have sympathized? With Aeneas, would they have said, you know, you should have killed him. It's fair. Or would they have said, oh, Aeneas, you, you did the wrong thing. I mean, you made a mistake. I understand why you did it, but you made a mistake. You should have let him go. That would have been the more noble act. How did our audience respond to that? That's a very good question. I don't think we know. But I think it's, it, this is the moment that makes Aeneas as interesting to me as Dido is in book three, right? When they have tough decisions and they give in to flaws of their character. And, uh, and it's motivated by guilt and it's motivated by anger. And it's, it's when these characters are at their most human. Writers, critics, academics, professors, who say that, that these characters written in classical era are not realistic, are not, are not reading the same poems I'm reading. I think these characters are incredibly realistic. They have challenges and problems, and they try to navigate those problems, and they give in and fail in very human, understandable, sympathetic ways. Well, um, all right, so this has been a very brief discussion. I know it seems not very brief to you, but a very brief skim of the uh, Aeneid and the books of the Aeneid. It hopefully will give you some signposts as you read. I'm going to pause and stop here for today, and uh, I'll be posting up your midterms. You'll have a week to work on those, and then we'll start in on Beowulf, Okay. But that'll be the second of the third sections of our class. So think of this as an end, and the midterm will deal with the previous readings. The Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, the Iliad, the Aeneid, and connections between them and how they relate to one another. Okay? All right. Please continue to keep work on, on our um, discussion boards and contact me online. Uh, and I'll put up the quiz in the next couple of days, and you guys will have time to fill that out. Uh, after you've done the reading for this week. Okay? All right. See you then.